This is Brass Check. I'm recording this on March 29th, 2020. And um, some good news. Uh, New York State had previously banned nurseries uh, and plant centers as unessential businesses. And uh, last week they understood that, no, we actually have to grow things. So uh, if you've got a plan for a garden this summer and you need all the things required to start a garden or to continue your existing garden, you'll actually be able to go to a store and get the stuff you need to do that. So that's that's good news. Um, another piece of good news is that New York State has recognized that they need to build separate standalone specialized hospitals just for patients of this particular virus. And um, I did a little research into that, and certainly the Chinese were doing that. Um, however, I did some deeper research and discovered something a bit alarming. Um, the Chinese knew, how to, knew, knew that they had to do this back in 2003 when they faced the original SARS epidemic. So uh, I can understand us uh, not knowing that this is an a well-known thing. This is a well-known thing. Uh, it was reported in The Guardian, uh, not an obscure newspaper. I would assume that people who get a paycheck as public health officials and people who are supposed to uh, serve uh, to protect the public from uh, epidemics would have been aware of that. So the fact that New York State is only just figuring it out now um, when this was known in 2003 is um, is not impressive. It's, it's really not impressive and which raises the question when this is all over uh, are we going to have a thorough investigation into I think what can only be described as uh, ignorance, arrogance, and dereliction of duty at the people who run the US public health system and that would include the academics at the medical schools uh, because uh, this is this is not a surprise right this this disease is really SARS 2 and 2003 we had SARS 1 and in SARS 1 by the way everyone likes to you know criticize the Chinese the criticize the Chinese recognized this disease pretty fast it took them a month this is brand new. This particular variety is a brand new disease, never before seen. So a month is actually very fast, and they took corrective action very fast. And uh, I know a lot of people don't like Trump, but we have to give him credit for closing the border to China very fast, and then closing the borders to Europe very fast. It was the right thing to do. Um, so. In 2003, we had a, a SARS epidemic, the first one, and China knew we need, this is such a serious disease, we need to have hospitals that deal only with SARS. And this just makes perfect sense because you can keep track of the healthcare workers much more closely. Um, only those who are working with SARS, the patients have an elevated chance of getting sick. And then the rest of the healthcare system you know, the broken legs, the heart attacks, the uh, women giving birth, you know, all those things, um, they're not going to be at risk uh, from cross-contamination or cross-infection. And there'll be a solid um, cadre of healthcare workers that can take care of the normal health needs, which don't stop just because we're in the middle of a pandemic. So, again, I'm, I'm just mystified at all the people who draw a weekly salary paycheck with health benefits with a lifetime pension who are supposedly epidemic specialists who just t didn't seem to be interested in what they were supposed to be doing. I mean, what, what, what have they been doing since 2003? Um, it's a long time not to to uh, become informed about how to deal with a specific emergency. And there's something else 
you may be aware of. I'm, I'm just sort of sorting it out. There's a very good article that explains that um, the COVID-19, as it's being called, is a coronavirus. We know that. But that the previous SARS epidemic in 2003 was a coronavirus. And there's another virus called MERS, M-E-R-S, which is also a coronavirus. Um, the it's a good news bad news situation the good news is that COVID-19 is nowhere near as dangerous or deadly um, as SARS-1 I'm going to call it and MERS okay if you get a serious case of MERS um, your chance of dying is one out of three uh, if you got a serious case of, of SARS-1, it's 1 out of 10. Uh, the numbers that were being given, which I am seeing a lot of evidence are completely wrong, is that, that the mortality rate for COVID-19 is between 2 and 3%. And even in this article that I'm reading, it says it, it could be much lower, but it, it's too early to say. And... I haven't personally crunched the numbers, but somebody who I trust did, and he says it's more like 0.3%. So good news is it's not as uh, deadly to as many people as the previous SARS epidemic and the MERS virus. The problem with it, I think everybody knows this, and this really should have been made clear from day one, so that people understand how to protect themselves and how to protect other people is that it spreads really fast and really easily. Uh, so it becomes a math problem. If it's less f dangerous but more, but many, many, many more people get it, what's the net effect? Well, the net effect is going to be cr hospitals that are super crowded. Um, a lot of news talk about the need for respirators and of course had this thing been contained uh, wouldn't have needed all these respirators um, the question too is did China have enough respirators or not that's I don't see anybody talking about that then if we don't have enough respirators uh, if we have less respirators than China, um, that's another investigation down the down the line, and not an investigation of politicians because they're all useless, but investigation of the people who held themselves up as experts on these things. You know, where were they? You know, um, couldn't anybody have said, "What if we had a coronavirus that?" spread 10 to 100 times faster than SARS-1 or MERS, what would happen then? So this is, you know, we're going back to 9-11. It's like, oh, nobody could have ever imagined a hijacked plane being used as a weapon. Well, in fact, I have a book <laughs> written in the 1990s that talked about that in detail. And uh, the President of the United States had a report on his desk in August of 2001 about it. So, this, so that's nonsense. So the idea that nobody knew this was coming... Um, or could come, who was a epidemiologist and a high-ranking public health official or a lifetime professional in that field, is just nonsense. It's just absolute nonsense. Uh, I think that's all I'm going to say about this, but I think the, the, the key takeaway here is that... Um, We've seen this kind of disease before. It is not a surprise. Um, what is a surprise is how fast it travels. Um, but we are saved to a degree by the fact that it is a, it, it, it negatively affects a lot, a much smaller percentage of the population. And that the only way really to deal with this is intelligent social distancing. 
but then we have the question oh and I, I can't find an answer to this question which is the Chinese built separate hospitals to treat this particular patients with this particular disease both in SARS 2 what we have now and SARS 1 previously did they have special dormitories specifically for those healthcare workers and the reason I ask that is the if the if this thing well this thing does tr transmit very easily which means it's inevitable that the healthcare workers working directly with lots of SARS-2 COVID-19 patients are going to get this thing so when they get it then what they go home to their families and give it to their families because we've told families to you know to shelter in place and you know now people are being scolded for even walk, taking a walk in the park so again, I don't have an answer to this question but uh, clearly we need specialized dormitories for the people that are working with these patients and as a matter of fairness and intelligence we need to be supporting very intensely the families of the healthcare workers that are treating these particular patients and that would be a very that would be a really good use of, of money and, and containing the the spread of this thing the Chinese were actually fast on this and I want to I want to go back to that point because you know this has been politicized and I have a political opinion by the way I think people that get paid to do a job should do it uh, and and they should even do it well if they're well compensated so that's my that's my only political opinion that but we're it's been politicized it's being used to attack Trump and you know God knows he's a in, an easy target because of the way he c conducts himself no, in, under normal circumstances but I think it's what what, M, what MSNBC is doing right now is absolutely appalling the only thing we need to hear is science and public health information we don't need to hear anything else oh there's one other thing I keep forgetting that's so important that is not being shared <clears throat> half of people or half to a third of people that go on respirators for any reason not just COVID-19 but if things are so bad that you're on a respirator for any reason you have a 33 to this is rough numbers 50 percent chance of being dead within a year okay so those are those are the odds it once if somebody gets to the respirator point so again you know the need to take exquisite care of people that are have health vulnerabilities and for people with health vulnerabilities to take exquisite care of themselves that's not a trivial thing at all um, something else I want to say kind of saying all this out of order but to take care of the enormity of this situation we have to have a functioning economy and we have just taken out and shot the entire restaurant industry uh, which employs millions of people we have just taken out and shot the retail industry which employs millions of people um, people in construction are still employed but you know a lot of construction has to do with money being available for construction in fact all construction depends on money being available for all construction if you remember 2008 there were a whole lot of half-built construction projects all over the country because the money just stopped and that can happen here probably will happen here so we're gonna see a huge hit on the construction industry as well um, I you know we're, we're getting to the end of the month here and I'm wondering how many millions of people are not going to be able to pay their rent all at once you know there was a study floating around pre-pandemic that said 
something like 40% of Americans cannot did not are not in the in financial shape to weather even a $400 emergency and uh, that should have been alarming uh, to have a population that's that uh, um, vulnerable well this is clearly a $400 emergency for many many millions of people so what's going to happen uh, when the rent is due next week or not next week I'm sorry this week uh, then there's the issue of landlords and people aren't very generally very uh, uh, sympathetic to landlords but you know the landlord has to pay the taxes on that building the landlord has to pay uh, if if it's a financed property he has to pay the mortgage if the landlord's providing utilities as part of the rent has to pay the uh, utility bill um, maintenance uh, so the expenses of the the landlord don't stop you know it's really weird there was that that guy uh, running for president and I'm, I can't believe I don't remember his first name but his last name was Yang uh, and he had a proposal which sounded a little crazy uh, but under the current circumstances doesn't really sound crazy at all and his proposal was to give everybody in America a thousand dollars a month now it's a it's it's a, like it's a weird I'm not gonna say it's a crazy idea it's an unusual idea um, and he was his idea behind that was you know we're automating so many things now uh, they're even trying to automate truck driving God help us uh, and by automating you you are you're putting people out of work and the more you automate the more people are out of work and then what I mean they're not going to people aren't going to disappear they're still going to be there uh, so the, the idea was to help uh, cushion that that coming blow so here we are um, March 29th 2020 and we have it a blow 20 times that large well no I mean I can't even estimate how much bigger and it's happening all at once so the powers that be that control the money supply just engineered a bill for primarily their friends um, with with some crumbs thrown to working people and you know I don't have the, the details but I think everyone's going to get a twelve hundred dollar check or something like that but they're only going to get one um, and then that's it well I don't think you have to be an economics genius to uh, realize that one payment one time given how this thing is unfolding is going to be anywhere near enough so here's my question candidate Yang talked about this thousand dollar a month thing for months it was ridiculed it was uh, ignored whatever uh, well here we are where we need this thing and I'm gonna say people that that are unemployed I think in addition to whatever unemployment they're getting and here's the here's the problem and uh, I am one of the, now I'm not I'm in perfectly fine shape by the way uh, but I'm an example of somebody who if I were to lose my businesses um, would not qualify for any kind of unemployment insurance and there are millions of us including all those owners of all those small businesses when they have to turn out their lights and close the door and with sorrow send their employees packing their employees are going to the unemployment office the owners there ain't no unemployment office for small business owners so I would say that we should be talking about in addition to supporting everyone who's unemployed uh, this this idea of checks to I, mean, I can't believe I'm saying this but you know what it's war you know and this is this is the equivalent of war in fact it's kind of economically it's worse and in war you got to do whatever you got to do uh, I've 
recommended that we not shut down huge swaths of the economy, but I don't know how we're going to get them to stop doing that. Um, so the next best thing is to put a tourniquet on and stop the bleeding. And I guess it's going to be a multi-trillion dollar tourniquet. And we're going to have to pay the piper for that someday. But we can't have tens of millions, many tens of millions of formerly working, income producing, self-supporting Americans suddenly with no income. We just like we just can't have that. So here's so here's my question. Why is no one talking about Yang's proposal now? I mean, I might be missing it because I, I don't watch the news that much. But on that point, it's been crickets. And he had a very simple proposal. You, you're an American citizen. You have a pulse. You're getting a $1,000 check per month. I would change it to an American citizen. You have a pulse. Your income just went away. Self, Self-reporting, honor system, and we know there are people that are going to going to take advantage of it. But say la vie, um, raise your hand and you're getting a thousand dollars a month till this is sorted out. This will this will stop the cascading effect that I'm shocked uh, Wall, you know professional Wall Street TV people aren't talking about. When people don't have an income, they don't buy, they don't pay their rent, they don't pay their bills. We're facing a construction crisis. We're facing a banking crisis eventually, right? Banks loan money. The money doesn't come back. Uh, if that happens enough, you have insolvency. Uh, we're going to, if that, if, I, and I keep saying if, but I don't see how this fails to happen. Uh, we have a run on the banks. Uh, we do have this thing called FDIC. But the I in FDIC is insurance, and it is a fund, and it is finite, and it's calibrated to only a small percentage of banks failing at a single time. What happens to that fund if we have a bigger than average run of bank failures? And given the fact that we're, we're going to have the probably the biggest unemployment numbers in the history of the United States since the Great Depression, uh, and, and somebody pointed out, and I think this is really important, you know, the Great Depression was a disaster, but it was sort of a relatively slow moving. Everybody didn't lose their job on the same day or the same week or the same month. So we actually are facing something worse than the Great Depression with, with all this uh, lack of income that people are going to be facing. And the cascading effect, right? They're not going to pay rent. They're not going to go to the store. They're not going to pay on their credit cards. Not because they don't want to, but because they can't. All right. Um, okay, so another another point that needs to be made. We talked about respirators. When you put a COVID-19 patient on a respirator, you are literally aerosolizing the room that patient is in with the, we'll call it the COVID-19 virus. Okay, so if, if we have to stay six feet apart, which maybe we do, um, and if workers need to be wearing masks if they're coming into contact with the public, and maybe they do right now. Um, that's not aerosolizing. That's just, you know, the, the, the small amount of, of uh, vapor that comes out of our mouths when we talk, you know, and it travels a certain amount of distance and you want to be on the opposite side of that distance and then you're going to be fine. But when you got a, someone on a respirator, everything in their lungs is coming out in aerosolized version. So if the healthcare workers that are, so this shows you the extreme 
urgency of having these patients in their own dedicated buildings and having healthcare workers that are working with them exclusively and of supporting those healthcare workers exquisitely. And I'm not seeing, by the way, evidence that those healthcare workers who, now I'm not saying every nurse and every doctor has got to be treated like a prince or princess just because there's, a, there's this epidemic, you know, but, but the ones that are working in the dedicated facilities specifically on the SARS patients, uh, there, there is no check too large to be written to make sure they're supported. And I'm not seeing that. Uh, I saw a report of a nurse that's claiming that she's working 100 hour a week shifts. Now, from one of the stories that we ran a, a week ago, one of the medical teams that was sent to Wuhan from northern China, and by the way, have we seen any of that? Have we seen surplus medical capacity sent? to the hotspots in the United States, either from uh, other hospitals or our military. You know, our military has a huge medical wing. Has to. They've got two million plus employees. Um, I don't know. Does anybody know where they are on this? Maybe, there, maybe things are being done. Uh, but anyway, in China, they knew they had a hot spot in Wuhan, so it was all hands on deck, and, hot, and doctors came from all over by the thousands to the hot spot to work on the situation. Anyway, one of those teams, and I, we had this as a report on Brass Check a week ago, um, they had four-hour shifts because they knew how dangerous it was to work on these patients. They knew how contagious these patients were, and they knew how easy it was when fatigued to make a mistake with your own self-protection. They also had a committee of employees whose job was to help supervise the self-protection protocols of the healthcare workers working on the SARS-2. On the SARS I'm going to call it SARS-2 because that's what it is. SARS-2 patients. I'm not seeing, maybe it's happening, but what I'm seeing is a lot of healthcare workers going to a lot of hospitals that are not segregating SARS-2 patients and the healthcare workers are not getting the uh, equipment they need. I mean, there are a lot of people in the hospital for non- um, infectious reasons, right? So, you know, the people who are, the, so the segregation of patients is so important because then the people who are working with, you know, the broken legs, the heart attacks, that kind of thing, they um, maybe don't need quite as much protective gear, right? So all that protective gear could be given to the uh, nurses and physicians who, who actually need it. But anyway, this, this aerosolization of the virus among people who are on respirators is a very um, worrisome thing. Anyway, um, last bit on this, and I may have said this before, but again, I'm working without notes. The Chinese have been criticized, it's been politicized, you know, China is rotten, and this is just proof, etc., etc. Um, well, you know, it's a big country, it's a poor country, uh, it's still an intensely rural country in many ways. People are packed together. Uh, so they're going to be the origin, the origin of a lot of disease, right? Switzerland is probably not going to be creating a lot of pandemics? Well, because it's a well-to-do country, everybody's working in, you know, semi-antiseptic conditions, uh, and, and they're not packed together, right? Well, the China, that's, the, you know, the, the China is what it is, you know? You can't, so, so anyway, so blaming China is ridiculous. Also saying that, that China didn't handle this correctly, I think is unfair. With SARS-1, which was a brand new, never before 
class of disease. Like we're not you know, SARS-2, the one now. We've seen this before. Anybody that tells you we haven't is lying. We're, this is a diff, just a different flavor. But all these epidemiologists and professional public health people, and all you know, for them to say this is unprecedented, it has unprecedented qualities, but it's not unprecedented in essence. This kind of a disease we've known about since 2003. It's called SARS. It hit China in 2003. Now, in 2003, it took them four months to get it together. All right. Now, we, now then, then, then there was the MERS epidemic, which is limited to the middle, kind of focused on the Middle East. Thanks to the fact that these other two diseases emerged. And this third related disease, China was able to uh, turn it around much faster. Chinese scientists had the genomic sequence of the new virus publicly available soon after the outbreak was announced. So they did a much faster job this time. And again, you know, when a new-ish, when a new variety of a disease emerges, uh, a new flavor, uh, it, it, you know, it's not like it has a sign attached to it. The doctors have to first recognize it, uh, first identify the pattern, uh, recognize it, and then start studying, and then figure out what they're facing. So they didn't know that, but you know what? They know now, and they have provided a lot of guidance, and this takes take this full circle. <clears throat> In the first SARS epidemics, 2003 SARS-1, they knew enough to build, to rapidly build separate SARS-specific facilities for SARS patients and SARS healthcare workers. They knew that in 2003. They did it again in 2009, uh, 2020, early 2020. It was reported here, but it was reported here as if it were the most unbelievable thing ever to happen in world history. No, it was not. And you didn't know it. I certainly didn't know it. But don't you think this population of public health officials, scientists, academics, policy leaders, all of whom are well paid, well pensioned, and get all their health benefits. None of them, by the way, none of them will lose a paycheck miss a paycheck. Not one of them. Now to a certain extent, you know, the, the low level people in that profession, well, what can you do? You know, everybody I guess has to follow the leaders. But we have to figure out who these leaders were. Not And not just under Trump, but under Obama. Since 2003, this should have been on the radar screen of every serious person in the public health arena. And the fact that it wasn't, and that this was that this has been treated like a wow, we've never seen this before, is a fraudulent proposition. Uh, we've seen a much, much, much more serious variety of this called SARS-1. What we haven't seen before was something that spread this quickly and this easily. But again, I, I'm going to think you would run scenarios if you're a an epidemiologist, you would say, okay, we just had SARS. What if SARS were 20 times more uh, transmissible? Then what do we do? And, and you say, well, you know, gee, that's not fair. That That's hindsight. No, if you're a fireman, you think about how to put out fires. And if there's a big fire somewhere and it goes wrong uh, or it's particularly difficult, uh, you study it. So that if there's another one, you are prepared. And there's no evidence that anyone in the U.S. public health uh, arena in a position of power, and that includes all the medical schools, all the research institutes that have been taking hundreds of billions of dollars over the years to do, we should really look at what they've been doing. Um, this should have been prepared for on an institutional level. There should have been, you know, we, we, you know, we have a plan to invade and destroy every country on Earth, right? The, that's 
a job in the Pentagon. Okay, so not Somalia. Okay, how do we go in there and kill everybody and take it over? Uh, you know, Botswana. Who's working on the Botswana plan? Um, we didn't have a plan for what happens if a disease that we already know is dangerous, SARS, were to jump the rails and you know spread at you know 100 times the rate of SARS-1. Nobody in this whole public health world. Okay, now again. No reason for me to know about this before. No reason for you to know about it. No reason, let's say, for your 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 doctor to know. Right? He's a he's a GP or he's a cardiologist or he's a gastro whatever. You know, they can't know everything. Um, but the people who run the hospital system of the United States, the people that have been drawing paychecks as epidemiologists, the people at the CDC. And I'm going to not talk about the CDC because I cannot talk about them without my blood pressure rising. But just I'm going to say this calmly. They have one function and one function only, the Center for Disease Control. Their entire reason for being is preventing or is, de is recognizing, dealing with, preventing and ameliorating uh, epidemics. There's no evidence that they were prepared in any way. And when I say any way, that includes reading the newspapers about what the Chinese were doing in January. Forget about reading, going back and looking at how the Chinese dealt with it in 2003. They didn't even bother to read what was going on uh, in January. And then, and I'm going to end with this. We did a long report on John Hopkins. And, you know, it's a big institution, and there's a lot of people, and, 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 a, and a lot of people are doing their best. But again, this is an institution that, and this is not just limited John Hopkins. We have medical schools all over the country. They all receive billions and billions and billions of dollars in, in, in taxpayer money and in foundation money and in donations. And God knows they charge the, the kids top dollar, you know, ruinous fees to get their education. These are money machines. And we ran a story last week about the fact that John Hopkins only just got on the phone with their counterparts in China on March 19th and only just learned some of the things that I'm talking about on this call. And if you go back to the you have to find it somewhere on the site. I go into that, what they didn't know and what they finally learned on March 19th. It's hair-raising. Um, they were operating hospitals. They are advising physicians. They are training physicians. How could they not have taken this seriously when they at least been curious? I mean, you're, again, I'm going to go back to the fireman or even a plumber. I mean, any working person, you're a plumber. You see some bizarre, you read about some bizarro thing that happened. And you go, damn, never heard of that. I better read up on that in case it happens to one of my clients, right? Am I wrong here? So what was this public health uh, uh, industry profession doing in January? in February, in early March. Uh, so I'm hoping, you know, that when all this is over and we're back to some normality that that, that there's going to be a house cleaning, that we're not going to make every public health official a hero uh, 